Congressman Michael Guest is running for his third term representing Mississippi's third district. He is the former district attorney for Madison and Rankin counties. And Michael Guest, Congressman Guest, welcome to Mississippi Insights. Uh, thank you for having me back. It's great to be with you today. Thank you. We're delighted to have you. Why are you the better candidate in this runoff election? You know, I think it's clear that, you know, I have a conservative record and I have been actually representing the people of Mississippi for, for decades now in various capacities. You know, Mississippi is my home. This is where I grew up. Uh, I've lived here more than 50 years. I was educated in the uh, public school system, uh, later attended both Mississippi State and Ole Miss, uh, and then came out and for 25 years served as a prosecutor here in the metro area, working to see that our communities were great places to live. And, and worship and, and raise a family. Uh, this is where that I've chosen to raise my family, uh, having two boys which have both graduated from Brandon High School and uh, will both be at Mississippi State uh, in, in the fall. And so this is home. And so I feel like that, that, that I have uh, the knowledge of, uh, of our area uh, and, and that, that I have a history of, of representing uh, the people of this state. And I hope that people will remember that, that they'll remember the things that I've done and they'll remember the, our conservative values, the things that I have fought for uh, since I've had the opportunity to serve in Congress. I try to remind everyone that, you know, since I've been in Congress, uh, we've been under Democrat control, that uh, it's not been Republicans in control of the House. Uh, and so we have been fighting very hard uh, to push back against what we consider to be an agenda that's not the best agenda for the American public. But we're looking forward uh, to November. We believe in November that Republicans uh, stand a great chance of taking the House of Representatives, uh, retaking the United States Senate, and we'll be able to move a much more conservative agenda forward, agenda that I I think most people in Mississippi would agree with. All right, and we are going to talk some issues here. In fact, uh, Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman talked about how frightened he is actually of inflation. And right now, our country under a staggering, I think, 8.6 Six, uh, yes, uh, inflation rate as of May, I believe. And um, so, what steps should we take to get this under control? And how would you help consumers with withstand these sky high um costs that we're, I mean, from the from the gas to the grocery store to uh, rents, everything. You know, and you're right, you know, you, you look at inflation, 8.6%, uh, uh, the highest in decades. Yes. Uh, it affects every individual in Mississippi, but particularly affects your hardworking uh, middle class people who are out there living paycheck to paycheck, trying to make sure that they can put gas in the car and feed their family. Uh, some of that is being driven by sky high gas prices. Uh, we know that on uh, what we've seen within the last 16 to 18 months, uh, since uh, President Biden has been sworn into, into office, we've seen a gradual rise in gas prices to the point now where Americans and people in Mississippi are facing $4.50 a, a gallon, uh, and that impacts uh, their pocketbooks. And so we've got to make sure that we are opening up drilling in the United States so that we can produce our own energy needs, whether that be offshore drilling, whether that be in some of our, our, our natural, national lands, uh, we saw President Biden come in very early in his administration within the first week and issue a moratorium and say we're not going to allow more drilling. Uh, well, I, that was the wrong message to send. Uh, he also came in very early and shut down the Keystone Pipeline. And so while that would have not been domestically produced, uh, that would have allowed us to purchase, ally, uh, purchase oil from our greatest ally to the north, Canada. We cannot be relying upon countries in the Middle East, be relying on Russia, be relying on Venezuela. Uh, if Iran, if the JCPO, PCOA uh, agreement is in place. We can't be relying upon them to meet our energy needs. The other thing we've got to do is we've got to stop spending in Washington, D.C., which drives up inflation. Uh, the last spending bill that was passed, uh, the last uh, bill that was passed, which was called a COVID relief package, was passed with zero Republican votes, added $2 trillion in spending to the national debt. And so we can't continue to spend. You look at my opponent, he has uh, introduced a plan that would call for $48 trillion dollars in new spending. That is not what we need. That is not conservative politics and that would do nothing but exacerbate the problem that we're seeing now. What about the gas holiday? Are you supportive of that? I would be supportive of that on a short-term basis uh, to give Americans that relief. But along with that, 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 that's not going to solve the problem. That provides a very temporary relief for a matter of a few weeks or a few months. We've got to get back to producing domestically. We've got to drill, we've got to produce here, and we've got to be able to meet our own okay. energy needs. All right, we're still waiting for a Supreme Court decision on Mississippi's case on abortion. 
should Congress play a role in demanding or determining new abortion law if the court overturns Roe v. Wade? You know, I, I think that, th that this should be a state issue. I, I think that what we have seen is we saw the United States Supreme Court roughly 50 years ago uh, create a standard of fetal viability, uh, which was not something passed by Congress, uh, and they have then imposed that upon every state in the nation uh, uh, since uh, that went into effect. We know that during that time that there's been roughly 60 million children who have died uh, because of, of abortion. Uh, I believe that this is a state's rights issue. I believe if you look at this, uh, and I think the law is clear that the federal government should allow each state to be able to set their laws on the protection of life. I feel very confident that our governor, our lieutenant governor, our legislature uh, will do everything that they can uh, to make sure that we are protecting life here in Mississippi. But in my view of the law, in my research, in the amicus brief that I help lead to the Supreme Court asking them to overturn Roe v. Wade, this needs to be a state issue. We need to send this to the states, and states need to be able to set the laws that they feel are necessary to protect life. All right. Nation as a whole has seen a historic increase, 35 percent in the firearm homicide rate. Now, our state has the highest death from firearms in the nation. What measures do you support to address this? You know, I think what I support is, is aggressively uh, prosecuting the laws that we have on the books right now. You know, we see what's happening here uh, in the capital city, per capita, the most violent city in the country. Uh, a lot of that is because we have individuals who are committing crimes who are not being prosecuted. They're allowed to remain out on bond and they commit crime after crime after crime. As a prosecutor, I can tell you that nothing sends a message faster than aggressively prosecuting those individuals that commit crime. If we were to prosecute those people who are committing crimes and we're able to prosecute those people early, we would be able to prevent a lot of what we've seen on the back end. And so whether that be the U.S. Attorney's Office getting involved, whether that means more prosecutors here in the metro area, whether it means uh, agencies working together to consolidate prosecution, I believe that that would be the most effective thing that we could do to bring down not only violent crime, but crime down in general. Well, the Senate has just passed a bill that expands the background checks for gun buyers between 18 and 21 years old. It prevents people convicted of domestic abuse from owning a firearm, and it incentivizes states to pass their own red flag laws. Will you vote for this bill? when it gets to the House? If, as long as it has the incentivization for red flag laws, I will not support it. If that would be something that the Senate would remove, if there's some sort of compromise where that language could be removed, uh, I would consider it. I have not looked at the legislation this entirely. I, I've, I've seen some of the synopsis uh, that have been put out, but I have not and I will not support red flag laws. What's the, your opposition? Uh, because it puts the burden of proof back on the, the gun owner uh, to come in and be able to prove that, uh, to, to, to be able to, to possess his firearms. It gives the judge an ex parte order to means that they hold a hearing outside of having the claimant there. The judge can then issue an order allowing law enforcement to take the guns without due process. And I think that that's wrong. I believe that due process should be held in any of those hearings, that we should not allow red flag laws that allow firearms to be taken. We must protect people's Second Amendment rights and we must not make people go back into court to try to exercise those rights to possess those guns. Let's talk about that House Select Committee. Okay, on the January 6th attack on Congress in its second week of the hearings, do you support the panel's work? I know that you were part of saying that this should happen. And should former President Trump and his key advisors be held responsible for this attempt to overturn the 2020 presidential election? Now, I want to make it clear because this has been a, an issue of confusion for many people in this race. I did not vote for and I do not support the current Nancy Pelosi Select Committee that is being chaired by Congressman Thompson. What did you support? Right, I supported a law enforcement commission. Uh, that would have set equal number of Republican and Democratic appointees. They would not have been uh, elected officials. They would be people with law enforcement background. They would have had a very limited subpoena authority. They would have had a time limit of roughly six months to complete their inquiry and return a report to Congress. I think what we've seen now is this January 6th, the current committee has been politicized. We see prime time hearings where they're bringing witnesses on. This is no longer a search for the truth. This is now 
become a, a, this, a political witch hunt. And so while I did support it, and I think now we've even seen uh, former President Trump come in and say that he believes that Republicans should have representation, they would have had representation on the committee. And so I supported a law enforcement committee that had bipartisan support, but I do not support the current committee in place now. Well, Congressman, let me tell you that the, the most compelling uh, witness testimony has come from Republicans, uh, Arizona, Georgia. What do you say to that? Well, again, you know, I don't believe that this should have been something that should have been led by politicians. If we're going to conduct a true investigation, that this should have been something that law enforcement officials should have looked into. But they're and at I the center of it. They were at the center of this. You're talking law enforcement or I'm talking those the, the people that you're saying the the public officials were right there in the midst of it and and that's and, and that's another reason that they shouldn't have to be you shouldn't have people who are there on that day conducting the investigation. If you know, looking at it from my putting my prosecutor hat on, you know, when a law enforcement officer is involved in, say, an officer involved shooting, we don't let that law enforcement officer, that agency, look at. We bring outside individuals who can come in and have a neutral and attached view of what happened. This is being led by politicians, and I think many of their politicians are skewed in their views, and they're trying to use this to score political points. All right. Global affairs. The U.S. and our allies are pouring billions of dollars in lethal and non-lethal aid to Ukraine as it battles Russia. Your thoughts there? Should we stay? How involved should we continue to be? You know, I, I support the aid to Ukraine. I have voted in favor of that, as did uh, every member of the Mississippi delegation. Uh, I believe it's important that we stand with the people of Ukraine as they fight for the very freedoms uh, that we enjoy. Uh, what we must do is we must make sure that what is happening in the Ukraine is confined to the borders of that country. We do not want that to spill over into any NATO country, uh, which would then require us, uh, if uh, they so called upon us, to put boots on the ground. I think it's important that we provide them defensive aid, that we provide them uh, military aid, that we provide them intelligence and humanitarian aid as they're fighting for their freedom. And we need to do that in a manner in which we can do that to prevent American men and women from being put in harm's way. And the last thing we want is a third world conflict uh, that is developed uh, in Europe. Do you feel it's being done now? As far as uh, do I think the military aid, I think the military aid has been very successful and I think that you see that the, the fight of the Ukrainian people, they were someone uh, who, who have, uh, have, uh, have been outnumbered in both number of soldiers and the equipment that they have. They have been very effective with the military aid that we have provided. We have seen that they have stopped in many cases the Russian advance. They have even pushed back against Russian and counter offensives. And so I think what we're seeing now is something that no one expected. When we were briefed about a potential Russian invasion, we were told that the country would fall within 72 hours. Here now we are months later and we see that they are continuing to fight and they are continuing to score success after success against a superior foe uh, who is attempting to really just invade and take over the country that they call home. All right. Congressman Michael Guest, thank you so much for being with us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome.